this is Pam Lippett with another edition of Spotlight on Small Business. Uh, really during the pandemic, my goal is to showcase a lot of people like me who are trying to kind of cut through the noise and the clutter and, and get their wares, as it were, in front of people. And so one of the um, ways I've been doing that lately is I, I've been playing with this new uh, website called um, Quad Meets that I think I do believe I'll give a shout out to uh, Brenda Meller. I think I saw Rick, the, the guy who started that, on her podcast. So through that, I met Heather Lytle of Light, Lytle Communications. And so welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Pam. It's cl I'm happy to be here. Um, this is kind of a fun little setup. Yeah. Uh, with StreamYard and uh, the Hill Street Group. So I'm happy to be here with you today. So so um, some people will be watching this now and some people will watch it in review, though. Heather, you did a good job of pushing it out yourself, too. So we're hoping that people are watching. And if you are, you can comment now. If you watch it in replay, both times, just let us know where you're watching from. And if you watch it and replay and you have any questions, we'll be sure to get back to you. I'll follow up with those and we'll answer those as well. So today we're going to talk about um, an interesting thing. I, I had never met someone who does what Heather does, which is unique because I know, seem to know a lot of people. So um, Heather works with companies to do, to create their policies and documentation so that everyone's on the same page. And um, so I'm going to introduce Heather. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll talk about what you do in a minute. Sure, sure. So go. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I'm Heather Lytle, Lytle Communications. Um, I have spent probably most of my career in an admin sort of capacity or support capacity or back office capacity. And, and a lot of what that has caused me to do or how I think about things is from a risk perspective, because what is the risk if we don't do X? What is the risk if we do Y instead? So looking at a risk, how to address them without sacrificing efficiency, because we can say that we're, you know, oh, this is a big risk, this is a fraud risk, but if you don't have a better way to do it, mm -hmm. then, or if you over-engineer it, then nobody's going to want to do it. So my last career, uh, my last corporate America job, I worked for 11 years with a large international company, and I wrote policies and procedures for them. Um, and I loved it. It was, um, you know, I was in the finance area, and you're looking at a lot of different styles of financial reporting, um, a lot of different kind of how things work within work cultures across the world, um, and trying to find a way to standardize that without standardizing it so much that, you know, you miss some of that local stuff that still needs to happen. Um, and at the end of 2019, pre-COVID, pre okay. um, I decided to offshore my position, which happens a lot, um, you know, with an international company, you know, they could go to Central Europe, they could go to India, and they can hire somebody, or they can hire five somebodies for the price that it would cost for me. Um, but I had already started my, my firm because I had decided that this uh, policy and procedure and risk assessment and, and finding a way to mitigate risk was important for small businesses. And I knew they didn't have the capacity to do it. You know, it's it's so interesting because I've worked in nonprofits over the years, mm -hmm. and I always say the bylaws are your most important document to put in a drawer because <laughs> yeah, because the only time they're the most important thing you can do, but your hope is you never have to use them exactly. because when you have to use them, it means there's a crisis or a problem somewhere and you're checking usually like how to get rid of someone off a board or how to. Like, yeah, that, that's really forward, true. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I would, so, but process and procedures having also worked in a bigger company, 
like onboard, do you do onboarding manuals too? I can. Um, okay. Just whatever kind of business writing somebody needs. Okay. Um, my ultimate goal in life is to set, have somebody say to me, you know, I'm really not sure how to say this. And right. I just take what their idea is. I take their message and I just create the most fabulous message, message that I can. And they're like, yes, this is exactly what I needed. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's interesting because sometimes onboarding documents are crazy. Right. But, and in a business, they need to be fluid, but they're often static documents. Well, and that's your first impression as an employee. Right. It's like, you know, do I, am I coming to work for someplace that hasn't updated their policies since the 90s and they're still talking about sending everything via fax right. or, you know, some other sort of thing? No, it needs to be fresh. It needs to be new. It needs to be relevant. Um, but that's also to say it doesn't need to be so detailed and so overwhelming that people are like, yeah, forget it. And they just... What? Don't, don't use it again. So I've had a combination of jobs. I've had jobs where I have my very first job out of college. Here's what I got for prep. Zero. <laughs> Whatever this is. Zero. I got zero documentation except the, the form I had assigned to, for employment. And then, I, I mean, after a while, it was not such a good environment for me because I'm a rule... <laughs> I guess I'm a rule follower, but I like to have things spelled out. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like to break rules, but I like to know what rule I'm breaking. Does that make sense? <laughs> so you can say whether or not it's worth breaking. Exactly. <laughs> but I got nothing. And if it weren't for another director who said, no, 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 I need to spend three days with her and teach her what needs to be done. I would have been gone in six months. Right. On the other hand, I had a job once where, I had to sign so many onboarding documents to get my paycheck that it almost made me think like, why am I taking this job? If this job has so many issues involved in it, because mm -hmm. right, you 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 kind of add things to all those documents based on experience or based on right. prices. And I would I think the same is for the policy documents, right? Mm -hmm. Um Having, you know, having owned my own business, I know the letter I had people sign would change over time as I had a bad experience. Right. And really, um, I'm one of these people like, as, even though I'm a policy writer, I often think to myself now, and I tell clients this, I was like, if you put it in the policy, you need to be prepared to do it 100% of the time. So it's the kind of the weird exception where somebody, you know, wears a red shirt and they're, you know, whatever. And it's like, oh, no, we want red shirts on Wednesdays. It's like, no, let's so let's make it so that it's a usable document, that it's understandable. And there's a little bit of wiggle room, um, you know, because there's always some sort of exceptions. You can't rule to everything. And it's a really a balance of finding that right language. Um, it's, really, it, you know what? Yeah. it's really important. Yeah. And it does come from experience. Yeah. Yeah. I know my mom, I have cousins that are much younger. My mom used to say to, to a, a, a different aunt than we talked about before, used to say, you know, don't, or my grandfather really said, don't make a punishment for a child that you won't go through on or that you don't want to do. Right. So if it means staying home for two weeks and you have to stay home for two weeks with a child, you're not going to want to do that. So right kind of follows through. I mean, one of the things I picked up off your website, which I thought was really important, was this idea of creating the the consistency and transparency in the policies. And so mm -hmm. speak to that a little bit, because I thought that was so interesting. Okay, sure. Um, so I really think of when people talk about policies, we either like to use them as a threat or we use them as a shield, right? Um, right. Like, oh, I can't do that. It's against policy um, mm -hmm. or you're going to break the policy. But what real policies really are is they set expectations. Mm -hmm. So if you're an employee, I expect you to call in an hour before your shift if you're not going to make it. Um, if, I'm, I'm an if I'm an employer or an employee, I expect 
that my check's going to be there on Friday, right? And I expect X amount of vacation time because that's how it's spelled out in the policy. So because those things have been communicated either on the employer side, on the employee side, or even with clients, uh-huh. um, you know, as a as a client or a customer, I expect my infor- or my services or my product to be delivered by a certain time. Um, and I expect to know what to do if I'm unhappy with that product or service and how that goes. Um, so it's all about communicating expectations and how do you how do you communicate the expectations and how do you uphold those expectations is you really need to be consistent, you know, and you need to do it every single time. And you need to be transparent because communicating that and this is how we expect this to work and this is how we're you know this is how we operate and one of the things i say with vacation time especially is a lot of places some places will go by if there's really hot days you know where mm-hmm. people ask for time off a lot like around the holidays or whatever if you have people asking for time off at the same time and they both can't be off well who gets it the person who was there first or the person who asked first now mm-hmm. both are correct you just have to pick one you have to pick one and you have to uphold it yeah um so it's just all about just kind of setting those parameters and i think you know it's like if you play a game or if you're building something just knowing what's expected it makes everything easier you know i i like that because it, it, especially for like a um let's say a mid-level manager or something mm-hmm. it's so much easier to refer to you know, this is the policy and then let's talk about it as opposed to let me just babble at you for a little while and see what you retain. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I've had managers who have talked so much about policies or expectations that like they just beat you into submission. Like after a while you just lose the will to live and you're like, I'm not, I'm not asking any more questions. I just, I just want to get out of here. So I, I had a job where you had a, put in your orders, you know, your sales orders. Oh yeah. And so when I was new, I was like, oh my God, I never get any of these right because he bounces every single day. It would be like torture. And it was stupid stuff. It was stuff that he, and he won't be listening. He's a nice guy, He won't be, but it was stuff he could have literally fixed in 10 seconds and been done with it. Mm -hmm. which is what my approach would have been. And then send it back and say, you know, I fixed this this time, but next time you have to fix it. But but instead his response was your stuff is wrong. And then you had to go back to him and say, well, what was wrong? Because there was 30 lines in this thing. And so it created like a three hour redo instead of a 10 second redo. But my, my saving grace was the day I found out that he did this to everyone. <laughs> that was just, that was, I just, I was so special. <laughs> it, well, and that's the rule follower. You know, it's like, oh no, it's not my job to fix it. Right. And, you know, if you have a systemic issue, then you could definitely need to address it. But him not telling you up front what's wrong, right? Then you would know not to do it anymore, rather right. than just bounce it back and you know. Right. Usually at you know five fifteen. So <laughs> when when an order had to be in or right. you know to make the monthly deadline or whatever so yeah. um yeah so it's I, so like that's why i said i i am a rule follower and i like the rules and then you go from the rules <laughs> i mean if the rule says you have to leave at six and you've got something and you say to the boss you know what i i got this isn't me but i've got to be at daycare by six can i come in a half hour early so then you know the rule Right. And you ask for the exception to the rule. Exactly. And that's something that can work for people. But if right. you don't know the rule, yeah. you don't even know where to start. And you need some of that flexibility, too. I mean, to say, because, you know, everybody's a little bit different. We're not all robots. And so it's like, how do we work best together? Um, I had a manager one time because I am not a morning person. I, I just am not. And so she, it wasn't the rule, but she was just kind of the working assumption that's like, don't talk to Heather until like she's been here for like 20 minutes. 
<laughs> she's still that waking is, up. That was my role my whole life. So I get that. <laughs> Even before I drank coffee, that was my rule. Don't talk yeah. to me in the morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just leave me alone. I gotta wake up, come alive. Yes. So, yeah. So so tell me. <sighs> In this crazy world we live in, which is the exception, hopefully, and not the rule, right? I hope so. Um, tell me how things have been going. Because I know starting a company in a pandemic is really not as easy as we would have thought. <laughs> no. Um, no, it has not been as easy as I thought. So January 1st, 2020, um, I started to do Lytle Communications full time and, you know, spent basically January and February trying to get traction, um, you know, getting out there, meeting people and just really honing my message. Um, and mm -hmm. that, that takes a lot because that, that takes a lot of time. Um, and then in the middle of March, when we started shutting everything down, there were no networking events and maybe people did some virtually, but they just weren't that great. I mean, it was just, you're just lost in the sea of the, right. the, Brady, Bunch, the Brady Bunch box. Um, it was hard. It was really hard. And I, was, I will tell you, I like to tell people this, that during that time, I finished Netflix. So yeah. <laughs> It, it was just, bad they had more things. Yeah. <laughs> it's just me on the couch, just like, I don't know what to do. And I would just be like, I, I have no idea. This is, you know, I'm just sitting here um, doing nothing. And it really, it, um, it was really tough. And it was really kind of demoralizing in the fact that I'd never, ever been unemployed in my whole adult right. life. So I didn't know what to do. Um, you know, Netflix seemed like a great option, but it really wasn't. Um, but the thing that I realized is a couple things. One, I wasn't alone. You know, I have a lot of friends who are business owners, you know, LinkedIn, there's a lot of business owners. Everybody was going through the same thing. And two, as much as I wanted to, I couldn't just wait for normal to happen again, because I kept thinking, I know like maybe the whole month of April, I kept thinking, well, when things get back to normal, I'll start doing this. And then I kind of realized, you know, this might be normal for a while um, and try to figure out different ways that I could get out and reach people. And around that time, uh, Ryan Christopher had started Quad Meets, mm -hmm. which is an online um, virtual networking with you and three other people uh, for 30 minutes. And there was, I didn't have anything to lose. Um, so, I mean, that was a really way, good way to kind of get connected um, and really start getting motivated again by just talking to people and um, and really getting that connection that I had been missing um, just sitting in my house. So one of the things I did is I, I decided, because I also started around the same time, I'd had the business to do little projects, but I hadn't done anything full time with it. And uh, my company I worked for was acquired. So I was redundant, as they say. Um, never thought I'd be redundant in my life. <laughs> You're one of a kind, Pam. It's okay. I one of a kind. Am. But, um, I decided with that first stimulus check, remember there was going to be a second one. Yeah. Check, check your mailbox. Mm -hmm. Um, so I decided to take the majority of that money and invest in the business. Mm, okay. I know. Shocking. So I actually prepared to buy a new laptop with part of the money. I had other money that I used for that. And then I joined a chamber of commerce, mm. which is all virtual, but I have made some inroads there. And I think one of the, oh, someone just put a thumbs up in. So that was a good Ooh, thing. All right. um, so, you know, I, I joined and, and what it meant was that I could, uh, get into a group of people I would have otherwise not gotten to. And so I have an ambassador who's like kind of in charge of me. So that was, I like that. You yeah, know? Nice. And I joined a networking, small networking group within that where it's, you know, like a, a trading ideas and um, uh, contacts, you know, for, for business. 
but it's not, it's not, it's good. And I'm actually presenting about my business next week to about 15 oh, people. Yeah. And I'm presenting in another one. They have like five different uh, of these little small groups. And I've already been asked to present in another one of those. So I'm just trying to kind of, kind of turn things upside down. And, and that's kind of my, I told you before, that's my message for the day is for, <laughs> for these, for these, uh, Podcast are, is to be figure out something that's pandemic positive. Uh, mm -hmm. Would I have otherwise joined a chamber? Probably not. Would I have reached out so hard to people? Probably not. I would have probably gone to events and waited to figure out what came to me. I think that right now we have to figure out where we go to and 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 just kind of be out of the box to figure yeah. it out. There's and it's just like me waiting for for normal. It's like, well, when things get back to normal, it's like, they're, you know, and I mean, here we are, you know, mid November, and I know we're going through this again. So right. you know, there's a there's I mean, a huge second wave coming. I mean, so Michigan we, already shut, did a partial it, shutdown starting we, tomorrow. We, um, I think we're getting here, getting there here in Indiana. Yeah, it's gonna be yeah. Yeah, I actually kind of, I'm, 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 there's not a work term for it, but I mean, I know our governor and I was actually on a, um, a private group that she was Friday night that she was in and some of our other politicians and like, and, and that was what she was saying is we just, you know, if we don't buckle down and our governor has really taken a lot of grief, including, you know, that little thing I'm here in Michigan, by the way, that little thing like they wanted a kidnapping killer. But other than that, how's your day? You know? Yeah. Talk about positive. She is has the biggest smile and is the most positive person. And she is, if you haven't seen her on any of the things, you should go and watch her. Everybody should go and watch her because... You know how they always say, like, women couch things? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry, but we have oh, to. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm sorry, but we have to close down the country. I'm sorry, right. but you can't go to a group. She is right. She is what we want to be. She oh. says it, and she means it. I just heard this morning on a show about, they were talking about Thanksgiving and going or not, and the the doctor who was on said, no is a complete sentence. Ooh, I, I like that. That was one of the greatest things in the world. That is really great. And it's and it's hard. It's really it's hard. hard. I think we're taught, um, you know, maybe as women or maybe even generationally, you know, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings ever. You right. don't want to tell people no. And if you or you don't want to disappoint anybody. So, you know, by saying no, you're doing all of those things. And, you know, it takes a long time to realize, you know, do you need to develop those boundaries? Um, and I <laughs> told my girlfriends, I was like, yeah, since I own my own business, I kind of a hard, kind of a hard. I don't know. Can we say, can we say the A word? <laughs> You have to be. I I I owned a. I still kind of own it, but I, I no. I still own it, but it's it's kind of backburnered. A direct mailing company for thirty five okay. years. And during the downturn in two thousand nine, which you know hit Indiana hard, hit Michigan really mm, hard. Really um, hard. I yeah. had a lot of different uh, type clients, a lot of different industries, a lot of different things, and they all were imploding. But I had a builder who was always a great pay, and I did a lot of mailings for him. And mm -hmm. one big check wasn't coming through, and I called him, and he's like, that account doesn't have money in it. And I said, then, mm -hmm. okay, but you've got 12 other accounts. Oh, but they're separate entities. I, and I said to him, you know, it's the funniest thing. You, we, ha I, we have had this agreement for many years. I do the work and you pay me. Pay me the money. You did not call me and say, listen, will you do the work and maybe I'll pay you? <laughs> you know, I said, so we got to oh. figure that out. In the end, I'll tell you offline how we worked it out. But <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's not dirty. Don't get worried. But it was not, it was not a happy moment. But no, it is. 
just, you know, and it's, we can't just, and I think really this is for anybody who kind of seeks approval, because I know there's a lot of people who really want approval and I really want approval too. And, but I'll just look and go, you know what? I'm not going to do that. That's or right. one of my favorite phrases is I'll take that under advisement. Yeah. Um, which, well, let me think about that. I'll get back to you. Yeah. And yeah. And it's like, this is important. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, and, and apologizing um, or, you know, in a negotiations scenario, or if you're saying, I know it's a long shot, but it's like, no, don't say that because you ask for what you want. And if you don't get what you want, then you can settle for what they give you, but so, letting them know that they can give you less. Yeah. So I really would different. say that my answer to that is I have create tried to create my life not around the but, but the and. Ooh, I know okay. it's a long shot, and I'm sure we can figure out a way to get there. Ah, okay. I know that you can't make it Thursday, and let's figure out when you could get that work done inside. That's a really good one. Yeah, I like the and instead of the but. Yeah. Yeah. It it it. I think it empowers people. There, mm -hmm. th this this is not in this book, but and we're totally off topic, but we're having a good time. Yeah, we are having a good time. There's a book that Mika Brzezinski wrote called Know Your Wealth. I highly, I get no credit for it, but I highly recommend it okay. be read because she interviewed all these CEOs about the difference between when women ask for things and when men ask for things. Okay. And how, how it works, like how they perceive things. And she interviewed a really, I don't remember, but a huge company, a woman CEO, mm -hmm. who said that um, she once gave a talk and at the end of the talk, there, you know, it was Q&A, whatever, and then she left. And when she got back to her office, there was a woman standing outside her office. And, and she said to her, like, what are you doing? You know, what is it? And she said, well, I have some questions. And she said, well, why didn't you ask them? And she said, well, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the meeting, when you said, okay, we're done with questions, all the women put their hands down, all the men left their hands up, and you kept answering their questions. Oh, wow. And that, to me, was like, if I learned nothing else from that book, mm -hmm. that was the lesson I took away. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Keep wow. asking That's questions. Like yeah, that's and, really good. And so then you start, well, now I can't, but then I started looking in, in rooms about really what was happening. And when there was an end of a discussion, the men were still yelling out whatever they wanted. And the women were behaving because we're taught to behave. Right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting. It's a great book. It's a great book. So I know you're getting a shadow. It must be getting dark outside. Yeah, I think a cloud just went over the sky. <gasps> Not wow. I mean, the sun is actually out this morning, which is kind of shocking, but considering it's like 34 degrees, yeah, it's, <laughs> cold. it's cold. So we have to work on that. All right, so back to topic a little bit. Okay. All right, we're about a half hour in. We have about five, 10 minutes left. And um, I don't know if there's anyone to ask questions now, but like I said, you can comment below now or later. Let us know where you're watching from, and we will be happy to uh, get back to you with comments. I think, let's go back to topic for a few minutes. Okay. If, if we out very quickly, we can go off topic. But <laughs> let's go back. So if a company is looking to create a policy, okay. or create a, a book, a, a, a loose leaf, or whatever we call a binder, okay. what, what, what do you say the first, the very first step should be? I would think... Besides calling you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They definitely need to call me. One of the things that I think is really important within a company is kind of just think about the culture that you want to reflect and think okay. about what your actual needs are. So if you are a company, and this is happening a lot right now, that work does work from home, okay? And you need to work from home policy just to kind of put in place some parameters, um, you know, as far as what kind of internet, what kind of space that you need, that kind of thing. And 
if you are the culture of you really want to make sure that people are at their or at their desk all the time and giving you know being very polished and professional constantly then you need to communicate that in your in your policy however if you are one of those co companies that thinks okay we know you're at home we know you have you know kids at home pets at home spouses at home we want you we have the expectation that we want you to be at the staff meeting or at your managers meetings at these certain times but other than that as long as you're getting the work done and that you're checking in regularly mm -hmm. you're golden so really thinking about the culture and how you want to reflect that same goes for things like an internet policy because i will tell you people are using the internet the work internet for personal use i mean right. whether it's a lot or it's a little bit it's going to happen so if it's happening how one how are you going to communicate what's acceptable and what's not acceptable mm -hmm. how are you going to communicate what the parameters are um i worked at places where they said no more checking personal email because people click on spam links and that was causing right. virus infections right which happens but communicating it up front is really key so if you're going to have kind of those reasonable limits um within your company culture then your policy should should reflect that yeah and i think that probably in today's world there also has to be policies i i keep seeing like little um quizzes or whatever on linked on oh, LinkedIn. Yeah. How, no about yeah. um who's responsible for what you have to buy to work at home yes like at home expenses and so everybody's kind of in a different pot and so mm -hmm. you know the the admin who's maybe making thirty five thousand dollars a year but has to put the same thing in as the exec who's making 200,000 a year. Right. There has to be some parity there because yeah, exactly. And what is and and really communicating those expectations of and and office supplies is a really good point because you don't want people to just go like, "Oh, now I need a desk and now I need this and now I need that." So they go a little crazy, but you want to make sure that they have what they need to be able to do their job right. and whether or not you having you do kind of a still a central order portal like some places do that because they still get discounts or you just let them within a certain amount be able to order what they need right um, you know so yeah yeah though a desk and a desk chair is very important right right but you don't need all the office furniture and all of the yeah. and a return and a shelf and a thing yeah and it doesn't need you know i don't need the i don't need your you, office to look like a pinterest board okay you <laughs> mean painting the office isn't included yeah I, per I personally think there should be like a a price point like you can spend tell us what you already have let's figure out what you need it should be a conversation but it should be a conversation within a policy exactly exactly you know? because everybody's we, different and so many companies are just hanging on by a thread mm -hmm. that if if 30 employees each turned in a thousand dollar bill It'd that's a lot of money that is a lot of money and you know and also to, to kind of talk about within a policy you know mm -hmm. how do you treat equipment or and accidents are going to happen with equipment you're going to spill the kids are going to get a hold of it I mean, and, and one, you want to encourage everybody to do their due diligence, but what happens if a piece of equipment needs to be replaced? Before, in the old world, you would just pop up to IT and say, right. I need this replaced, but you kind of have to think ahead of the curve and go, okay, so how do I contact somebody with from IT? Because, you know, if your computer's fried, there goes all your information. Right. So, and, and there's policies too about, you know, now there's, um, you know, we're all using our, our good old, you know, Wi-Fi connection at mm -hmm. home and that's not secure as it was when we were in the office, if you're not right. in the office portal. So there's a lot, so that you, there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that you can help companies with. Absolutely. And it all and, depends on what they want to do. Um, if they have concerns, um, you know, and that's one of the questions that I I ask people. First off, is what keeps you up at night? 
because what keeps you up at night? We all need to be sleeping. Let's let's just be honest. But what keeps you up at night is the things that we need to address. It, and how can we address them, you know, thoroughly and efficiently without kind of sacrificing some of the, you know, freedoms or, or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely that's always my first question. And then it's like, okay, so what keeps you up at night? And what do we want to do about it? Right. I think I think that's really quite brilliant. Um, I think there's a real need for what you're doing mm -hmm. and creating that consistency. I think everybody likes to have a fair playing field. Right. And, exactly. And, and that's really what you're creating for employees and businesses. That's one part. The other part is what happens if something goes wrong? What are your protections? What are your things? You know, you, your boss isn't like popping in or can your boss pop in if you're using Teams and just listening on a meeting? Right. 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 You know, exactly. I, I like Teams actually. So, but, um, you know, Microsoft Teams, if you haven't used them, I do like I, them. I haven't. I haven't been. Well, I'm a team of one right now. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so me too. But you can connect with anyone. Oh, really? It. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, and it's encrypted. I don't know. Oh, okay. it's, That's nice. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, but so, I put up your website, Lytle Communications, and sure. you have a monthly newsletter that you I, suggest people sign up for and um, spread the word on it. Yep. yep. Um, and then we're uh, we have about five minutes left. I don't see questions though. Okay. Some people, let's see. Does anyone have questions? I don't. I don't know if they come up here. They come up somewhere else. I don't see them now, but we will certainly get back to them. So my question for you is, um, I know we're both active on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. which I think is so important. And that's a whole policy conversation of its oh, yeah. own, right? Media. Yeah. Um, but are you open to new friends, new connections? I am. And this is how I say this. I am open to any genuine connections. Um, anybody that's we're genuinely want to connect with each other. We want to learn from each other. We want to help each other. Um, I am always up for, for that. Um, I don't buy foreign exchange rate coins and I am happily married. So there's yeah, that too. That's that, I, I, I get that more than I ever thought that I would any, at any point in my life. And I was like, really? Where I think there's an the explosion point? on LinkedIn. I saw someone Yesterday I said like they're not seeing as much meaningful content as they used mm -hmm. to. I think it's because our networks are growing so much that yeah. before when we saw content, it was people we actually knew or were like really connected with. I have this thing on like my Facebook people. I can I can tell you one thing about every single person. Okay. On Facebook, I'm connected to. Right. I'm, of when we met, even if we met when we were three years old, I can tell you some. We went to elementary school. We, there, I can tell you something. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn, it it doesn't work like that. I and know. so yeah. there's a. I wish I wish we could make like close connections and then acquaintances as two different options. Like a different degree, yeah. Yeah, I, and besides the one, two, and three, I actually. Um, commented on something on LinkedIn last week, and I got a message from the LinkedIn people that they were sending my idea up the up the rabbit hole. Very <laughs> nice, very yeah, nice. I, I suggested that we can mark something unread in the messengers part of LinkedIn. Okay. So you can, but I think there should be like a bot, like you should be able to turn something red if you need to do follow up. Oh, wow. That is a really good idea. Right. Because a lot of it's yeah. just garbage, but we want either to pin stuff to the top, though. I think I saw something about pinning stuff today. Um, just like to be able because I get lost in that. I get so many messages these days. I oh, guess yeah. it's a, I guess yeah. it's a, pro a blessing and a problem. Right. Um, yeah. But even even when you so on on I don't know about you, when I get a LinkedIn message, I have some pre-done stuff that I send every person if they don't oh, okay. send me a note. And I'll only click yes if they respond to it because otherwise it's probably a bot or they didn't. Uh, okay. So, okay. But when you respond in a message, it doesn't um it doesn't 
keep it in the feed. So I never remember who I sent something to and who I didn't. Oh, okay. I can see that. So when I'm yeah. queen of the world, <laughs> I will make these changes on LinkedIn. That, oh. that, I'm not sure that'll be my first priority when I'm queen of the world. <laughs> yeah, I, I, bucket list, so don't worry about it. Okay. All right. All right. So we should be kind of wrapping up. Anything else? At what? What's your ideal client? If if we could send this out into the universe, okay, and say, you know, here are three kinds of clients that Heather Lytle of Lytle Communications, who's talking to Pam Lippett of the Hill Street Group, would like, and we have that, and we have synergy in our work. Yeah. yeah. Um, what would be the the three kinds of of requests you would want to get. Okay. Well, I love um, overwhelmed business owners who know that something needs to be done. They know something needs to change, but they're not really sure how to do it. So okay. those are my people. Okay. Those are, those are the kind of people I really like. Um, small business owners that um, have between usually five to 50 employees. Um, I do some work with sole proprietors. Um, but not quite as much as what I would do for between five and 50. Um, and um, anybody who does kind of like a back room operational type stuff, because that's where my sweet spot is. So any sort of financial reporting, any sort of, um, you know, like payment issue, mm -hmm. cash transactions, those sorts of things that we look at from kind of a security standpoint, a risk standpoint, and a standardization standpoint. Very interesting. Do you work with nonprofits? I do work with some nonprofits, um, really just to kind of help them protect protect themselves from themselves. Okay. So, um, which leads me to tell you that tomorrow me. I'm on here, uh, back on you know Spotlight on Small Business with Wendy Bice, who works with um, helping nonprofits with their vision strategies. Ooh. Oh, very cool. You gotta move forward. So you have to know where you're at and what you're right. doing to move forward. So you may yeah. want to watch. And Wendy's a really nice woman. So yeah, I have to check that out. Yeah. So that's the story. We're we're gonna wrap up now, but I it, it's great to see you again here. I'm sure we will keep connecting. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. And, well, thanks so much. Yeah. And anyone uh, you can recommend me to, and I'll send people your way, and I'll sure. see you on LinkedIn. Okay, sounds great. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, you can stay on, Heather, but we're okay. going to end the broadcast now. Okay.